for being here. Um, I am Paula Henderson, Chair of the St. Paul School Board, Board of Education. Um, I am also joined by Vice Chair Gerard Ward. Um, on behalf of the Board, I am here to provide an update on negotiations with our largest bargaining unit, the St. Paul Federation of Educators. SPFE is one of 27 bargaining units that represents staff who work for St. Paul Public Schools. Together, they are our largest employee group encompassing licensed educators, including teachers, educa educational assistants, and school and community service professionals. The bargaining teams from SPPS and SPFE have been meeting on a regular basis in September to negotiate mm -hmm. their next contracts in this bargaining cycle. We have seen great progress. Um, being made by both parties at the table, and we appreciate all of the time and effort um, that the bargaining teams have put into this important, oftentimes emotional, and time-consuming process. In addition to the areas of agreement um, that have been, have been achieved to date, the biggest area of difference is um, right now wages and benefits. As a board, our priority is to ensure that um, all of St. Paul Public Schools 33,000 students have the resources and support that they need to succeed in school and in life. And this includes ensuring that they have teachers and support staff who have what they need so that they can focus on helping our students reach their fullest potential. The board also has a responsibility to be good stewards of public funds and help ensure that our the long-term financial health of the district um, while, so while we agree that our staff deserve more for their hard work on behalf of our students, we also have to live with the resources available to us um, without compromising the services and programs that our students need to serve. Um, I will now turn it over to Superintendent Joe Hunter. Thank you, Chair Henderson, and thank you all for being here today. In 2010, bargaining for the common good became something that became well known to the entire country. At a time where traditional bargaining had run its course, at a time where school districts and education, public education, was really put under a microscope and devalued in ways that has had deep consequences in terms of how vouchers and choice has come into play, in terms of how the chronic underfunding of public schools has been felt by all. And it really gave a new voice to not only teachers, but entire communities of organizing students and parents and partners in ways that we hadn't seen prior to 2010. And SPFE has been incredibly successful in, in doing this. Um, they have uh, earned and, and gained a lot of respect, both here locally and across the country. They've been very successful. This is also the fourth time consecutively that I've been superintendent here, that a, a letter of intent to strike has been issued. And though I certainly don't like this and it doesn't feel good, it is being done within the state law as it uh, relates to how uh, bargaining is conducted in the state of Minnesota. Our budget priorities have been based on the needs of our students, staff, and families. And we've gone through a lot of different ways for us to determine this uh, for this year. And I'll go back shortly, or just a bit, to, to give a little bit of context in this. You know, all of us have been affected by the pandemic and continue to today. When the pandemic hit and we received the American Rescue Plan, we conducted a needs assessment. And we heard from more than 11,000 people giving us feedback on what they believed students, staff, families, and the community needed. Last winter at this time, we endured a series of very serious school and community violence uh, situations. And it caused all of us to really take a pause and re-engage with our communities in new ways to make sure that we were being responsive to the students and families and staff who needed us. And then most recently, we've conducted budget engagement to try to understand, based on all the priorities that we hear, that I think all of us agree with, what are the values that people hold so we can get to a place where we can make impact, collective impact, on the priorities that rise to the top. And those values that have come up time after time after time are literacy, safety and a sense of belonging, and respectful and respective schools. And some of the well-documented work that we feel compelled to sustain has been based on engagement with students, staff, and families alike. And I want to share some of, them, some of these with you. And to give you a sense of where I'm going with this, 
Although we face incredible budget challenges, there are $20 million or so in investments that we believe we've heard directly from our community, from our parents, from our staff, and from our students. And this is me directly hearing from our students. This isn't just survey data. This is out and working with our community. The first is literacy. I don't have to share with any of you that the literacy scores for students in the state of Minnesota, and certainly here in St. Paul Public Schools, are where any of us should feel comfortable or want them to be. We have great work to do. During the pandemic, we were fortunate enough to receive funding that allowed us to catalyze work that has been stagnant for years in terms of curriculum, training, and the structure to provide Tier 1 interventions, support to our classroom teachers to teach children who needed it most to read. That's our WIN strategy. What I need now is what WIN stands for. We've hired 84 teachers that I want to continue. With all the budget cuts and reductions and decisions that we're facing, I've told our team, I've told our community, to anyone who's listening, that I want to make this a priority. I've heard it from our community. They've given me, I believe, the license to say this is what we want. It's up to me to determine and share with our Board of Education of how we're making this a priority. Safety. As I shared with you, the history, some of the history on safety is school districts don't get a direct funding source for us to create safe and secure school districts. We get some funding in the safe schools levy. The safe school levy that St. Paul Public Schools and all public schools in Minnesota receive is $36 per student. So if we do some math there, that's about a million dollars. We spend nearly $5 million in our security and emergency management department. And it's a department I'm proud of. I think we've done some incredible work. I think the work has been recognized locally uh, throughout the state and quite honestly throughout the country in terms of how we've responded. You know, this is, you know, in July of 2020, we, the board voted to eliminate school resource officers. This has been one way that we've responded to our communities and said, you know what, we're going to continue to have safe schools, uh, but we need support to do that. I should also add that that $36 per student has been that way since 2015. And if you want to know what it was previously, it was $30 per student. So it went up $6 per student in 2015, but it's been the same. So again, this is an investment that we choose to make because it's what our students, our staff, and our families have asked for. Next, related to safety is buses. And I spent time with students last spring uh, directly. And one of the things that consistently came up, many of you know, or the community should know, that during the pandemic with the driver shortage, that we had to eliminate around 100 routes throughout St. Paul Public Schools. So we had to rely on Metro Transit in order to get our high school students to and from school. And we heard mixed results. To many students, there were safety concerns. Many avoided it altogether. Uh, some felt it was great. They had access throughout the city. But we made the decision based on that student feedback to restore yellow buses at our high schools. And I'm really proud to say our team worked so hard, uh, Transportation Director Ben Hardy and, and his team, to get the last school back online with the yellow buses following winter break. That was Coleman Park Senior High School. And I think the results have been great. I've heard wonderful uh, feedback from students and, and from families. Um, so I'm really proud of that. It was a $4 million investment. So this isn't money just being spent because administration wants to make a decision. This is being responsive to what I'm hearing as the superintendent of St. Paul Public Schools from our students directly, from our families. And I chose to take action. I chose to direct the team at a time where we are reducing budget all over the place to say, this is what our students really want. They want to feel safe. It's a value our community holds. Lastly, culturally affirming schools. Again, at a time where enrollment is declining or stabilizing, depending on how you look at these past few years for St. Paul Public Schools. The charge from the community is many of our students and families leave because they don't feel seen, heard, and valued at St. Paul Public Schools. And that hits my heart as an educator, as someone who cares about the children <coughs> in this community and wants to make sure that they can walk in with their head up, feeling good about themselves, and know that they're going to have an excellent learning experience for the day, for the week, for the month, and for the school year, and for their career, for that matter, at St. Paul Public Schools. As we had a work group last spring working on the development of an East African elementary magnet school, it became very clear to me that you know, we're ready 
but this group of parents and stakeholders are brought together, they're really ready. <laughs> they're so ready that they want to start the school in fall of 23. And who am I to say you have to wait? Who am I to have the decision and the ability to say you have to wait? We started that school, and I was there on the very first day, so I recognized the amount of work that happened from April until our first day in September, and it was absolutely incredible. And what's most notable to me about that experience is seeing the joy and pride the students are dropped off from dropped off to school on that first day, walking into their school, knowing that there were staff members and community members who, for years, that have felt like their desires, their dreams for the children of this community were going unseen, unheard, and unvalued. So in addition to that, we've also expanded our Hmong dual language program to middle school. We made that decision two years ago. We'll be entering year three of having grades six, seven, and eight at Zuki Upper uh, to go along with our companion Zuki Lower uh, Elementary School. Again, a thriving program in St. Paul Public Schools. I should also share with you that there is work underway for African American uh, culture and current language and culture to also be brought into St. Paul Public Schools. This is what our community is asking for. I'll share with you that as a leader who makes recommendations on how we spend resources, you know, we have two choices. We can either find out why students are leaving and take courageous action to do something about it, or we can just sit and understand that we're going to have declining enrollment and year after year reduce our budget. So we're at a somewhat of a crossroads. We really are, in, in this, especially in this budget year, where you know the number that we put out there is $107 million that we're I refuse to stop innovating. I refuse to stop listening to our students, our staff, and our families. So we are going to continue to move forward with those plans, and I believe build a better tomorrow for the students of St. Paul Public Schools. So again, those investments are about $20 million. And that doesn't mean that it's $20 million that we're getting from any one source. It means that we're making it a priority because it's important and it matters, and it's coming directly from our community. Some additional notes about other priorities that many have in St. Paul Public Schools is the incredible volatility of health insurance costs. Now, I'm not going to go into details about them as it relates to negotiations, but it's something I hear consistently from our staff when I'm on the bottom in the district. They're wondering, they're questioning, and they're worried about those ongoing costs. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about, will the wage increase and in inflation, will it match up with the increased health cost concerns as well? So these are things, these are factors, variables that we have to bring in to settling a fair contract with SPFE and all of our bargaining groups. I also want to note that you know, I do appreciate the St. Paul Federation of Educators uh, demonstrating a willingness to, to negotiate uh, the, the proposal, the conversations, the collaboration that's taking place, and already uh, some movement on, on targets that both sides have, have shown. Uh, tells me that it's important to get this contract settled. And I think all parties involved share that desire. Um, I really do. Um, there have been other years standing at this very podium. I don't know that I could have said that at this point. But I really do feel there's uh, interest and there's the ability and there's this desire to get this contract settled. I do know a few things that are adding uh, possibly some uh, challenges to this is other districts are settling too. When we start to compare percentages, I understand how that feels. Uh, but, uh, but I also have to share that SPFE, as I started with, bargaining for the common good and doing a great job of it, we have many things tied up that we, that we have agreed to in contract language that restricts our ability to have flexibility when it comes to funding. And I'm not at all devaluing that work or the work of the $40 million we invest in mental health supports that, that have happened in our last bargaining cycles, but it does make it very challenging when there are so many competing interests with a limited amount that we're able to budget towards our contract negotiations. So what I'd like to say is that many other districts are catching up to St. Paul Public Schools. We know that we have um, wages that are, that are really impressive on our teacher salary schedule, but we also have ratios that direct the number of student support staff that we have. We have numbers that direct class sizes. And it's really important. I'm not here to bemoan that. I'm here to state that it's a fact and it's a it's part of what we go into this 
negotiation session with. It's a, it's a constraint for how we're able to flexibly address uh, the needs, wants, and desires of bargaining groups. Lastly, I'll just share a couple more I'll share with you is that we know that strikes negatively impact the community. Uh, we know that March of 2020, uh, a time that none of us want to relive for a number of reasons, strike being just one of the things we were dealing with, uh, it was hard. It was a really challenging time. People questioning St. Paul Public Schools at a time where we worked so hard to put our best foot forward together and work collaboratively, and that was brought to a halt. Um, none of us want to see this happen. Our enrollment has stabilized. In fact, we're 400 students above where we were in October right now, and we're about 60 ahead of where we were last year at this time. These are the trends and numbers that I've not seen in my time here. Um, and it has me um, really excited about what the future can be. When you listen to your community, when you work with your community, when you value them as equal partners, and truly honor what their desires are, I think some of these results speak to that. And I would expect with some of the programs that I mentioned that are in development, uh, that we'll continue to see that kind of trend. And it has me excited. Truth be told, we know the number of students that choose to go to charter, traditional charter schools in St. Paul. And I believe that St. Paul Public Schools can do this work better than many of our charter schools. Maybe not all. I'm not asking anyone to compare. Uh, but I want to serve St. Paul children in St. Paul Public Schools and provide them opportunities that they're asking for. Uh, that otherwise they're choosing, sometimes in charter schools. Um, we'll do whatever we can to sell this contract in a way that's fair to our taxpayers, all of our constituents, uh, certainly our students and our families. Um, I want everyone to know uh, that that's top of mind for me. And it leads into this, my final comment. Yes, I'm leaving to go to Madison, and I'm excited about that opportunity. Uh, but I will share with you the primary, my number one responsibility to my job to the Board of Education, to all of you, is to make sure that this contract gets settled, gets settled without a strike, and that we can move towards a transition that sets St. Paul Public Schools up for the most incredible future possible. And I uh, just really appreciate everyone who's worked so hard to get us here today, know that we are going to hit the ground running on Friday, and we're going to settle this contract. Thank you. Uh, Executive Chief of Human Resources, Pat Brack. Thank you, Dr. Gothard, and good afternoon. Um, as Chair Henderson indicated previously, SPPS has been in negotiations with SPFE at least on a monthly basis since the beginning of the school year. Um, dozens of proposals have crossed the bargaining table, um, going both ways, and we've made a lot of progress. To date, we have uh, 25 tentative agreements um, that have been reached, and we also have 17 drops, and that's drops on both sides of the table. And so since January of, of, of 24th, um, we've actually had a total of five mediation sessions that's been facilitated by the Bureau of Mediation Services. Um, those have been full day um, mediation sessions. Again, we feel like significant progress has really been made, and this Friday will be our next session, and we are committed to being there the entire weekend, and our goal really is to settle this contract this weekend. That is absolutely our hope um, for, for this round of bargaining. A potential educator strike impacts not only our students, but it has significant disruption for the greater community. Many families and other community members really rely upon us not only to provide educational services, but also to provide child care, early child and family education services, adult education services, meeting spaces, act uh, recreational activities, etc. And certainly a strike would jeopardize not only our 33,000 pre-K through 12 students' ability to stay in school, but also us being able to sustain those programs as well during the duration of a strike. Avoiding a strike is most definitely in the best interest of our 6,000 plus employees because employees we've been, will want to continue to keep working, getting paid, doing their jobs without fear of layoffs or missing paychecks. To that end, to, um, by the end of today, we will be sending a letter to SPFE leadership expressing our willingness to actually pursue interest arbitration. Interest arbitration is an option for settling contracts 
that is typically used by many employees who are um, like first responders, certainly our principals fit into that mix. And this option would ensure that students have the ability to be able to remain in school and not be disrupted, um, have a disruption to the learning process. And the district can continue to operate as normal. And while arbitrate, in order for arbitration to move forward, we would need to have agreement by both parties. But that certainly is an option that is worth pursuing. As the lead negotiator for SPPS, I really want to emphasize that settling this contract is really our top priority right now. Um, we really feel that this is very important for our entire educational community for this to get done as quickly as possible. As we move forward in this process, we will continue to uphold our values for bargaining with SPFE and all of our other bargaining groups. And those values include listening to and communicating with our students and employees, promoting a culture that is focused on students, their growth and achievement, creating an inclusive school district in which every family, staff, and community member would enroll their children, and working within our budget while meeting our fiscal obligations. Um, at this point, I think we'll transition to any questions that might come from the audience. We've got a microphone here for questions, too. Raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, Elizabeth, Minnesota Public Radio. I hear the commitment um, and desire to figure things out this weekend, but if that doesn't happen, are there more mediation schedule, um, sessions scheduled, or is it kind of, if things don't get worked out this weekend, that's it? Right now, the letter of intent to strike has a date of March 11th would be the first day that uh, educators and SESP staff could, uh, could legally go on strike. So we're willing to work with the Bureau of Mediation Services to avoid that from taking place. I understand there was a, if, I'm, if I understand correctly, there was a closed door board meeting yesterday. Can you get, tell us any information about what was discussed and if that will help um, move things along? I will certainly defer to Chair Anderson if she has anything to add, but I'll simply say that a closed board meeting is done under the state statute to talk about negotiation strategies to make sure that the board is given clear direction to administration, to make sure that administration is reporting information back to the board, and that we can work in harmony in getting this contract settled. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Kyle with Axios. Um, you said bind, uh, arbitration. Would this be binding arbitration? And can you talk about what that would mean? Is this a is it quicker because the resolution would be dictated by an arbitrator to the district? Is that the process that you're describing? Um, it's called interest-based arbitration. And um, basically, the both sides would actually share what our proposals, what our positions are, what we're hoping to accomplish, and the outcome would ultimately be settled by the mediator, and it would be legally binding, yes. <coughs> Susie, WCCO Radio, following up on that, because it sounded like if you need the union to agree to this interest-based arbitration, correct? Correct. If they don't agree, then it's a moot point because you can't do it unless both sides agree, correct? That is correct. However, we would continue the process of mediation. Until the March, but only until Friday, as someone asked again. You're, there are no scheduled meetings after Friday. We don't have any scheduled meetings after Friday. As I stated earlier, our hopes is that we would be able to settle this contract over the weekend. If we're not able to do that, we would continue to work with the BMS in order to schedule additional dates for us to reach an agreement. And going back to listening to all the positive things that have been accomplished in the 25 sessions that you've had, um, is Wages, are wages and benefits continuing to be the major sticking point? And can you talk about how far away you are from one another in terms of numbers? I'm not sure that I could actually give you specific numbers today because anything that we've discussed to this point in mediation is still considered to be confidential. So we would not be able to give you anything 
publicly around what we've discussed since mediation has actually begun. Um, what I can say is that in our last proposal prior to mediation, um, we had given a proposal of um, 2 percent increase to the base for most teachers, um, but a 3 percent increase to the base for people who were early on in the salary schedule in, a, in a, an effort to kind of boost up um, the starting salary in those first um, few steps and lanes um, for teachers. Um, in, in year one, uh, teachers proposed a $7,000 increase to each cell on the salary schedule, which equates to about an eight and a half percent increase. So that's the difference where you are right now. That's the difference where we were before we started at mediation. We've made some progress since then, but we still have a ways to go. And do you think that money, the salary is going to be the deal breaker, that you won't be able to reach an agreement? I think money, I think wages and benefits for rank and file are the two most critical issues, um, which is why we're at, that's our priority focus. <coughs> yeah. And I understand Dr. Cotter mentioned all the money that was spent to invest in the district to make it more attractive, to get more students, to get more money, but at the same time, the teachers want the money. So is that sort of where you are, Dr. Cotter? Well, it's a, it, it's a balance. I mean, there's, there's only so much, and you know, to, to think that in the education of children, that there's competing interests. I don't like to refer to it that way. I like to refer to it as how can we maximize the experience for our students while providing the support necessary for staff. So it, it really is about looking at how can we match the student experience with the staff who it takes to, to operate a school, a district. And there are many who are uh, who just do incredible work. And as I share, one thing we should point out here is that we received historic investment from the state of Minnesota. Don't get me wrong, we did. But if you look back to 2003 and you look at the amount that school districts were funded, it only brought us back up to that amount of a very little bit. So we're not going to make up for the historic investment in one budget biannual. I have hope for the future. Um, I really do. Uh, but we certainly can't just go back to 2003 in, in one investment in the district. Any questions, Becky? Becky the office. Um, oh. um, hi, Becky from Sahan Journal. Um, SPFE yesterday was saying that they had really been hoping to see a, a new proposal from the district on wages and benefits and that they haven't seen anything new since the January proposal you mentioned. Um, can they expect to see that on Friday or can you, can you give an update on, on that? The last session that was held on Friday. Friday, last Friday. The last session that was held last Friday, um, time ran out. So there was a proposal that was shared, and uh, we'll continue to, to make sure that we work on that. And as Chief Pratt Cook said, it's going to be our priority. When you say a proposal that was shared, you mean the union shared proposal or the district shared proposal? The union shared a proposal. Uh, that proposal came you know, late at night, right before we were scheduled to end. And uh, you know, we've got to make sure that we're making the right decisions in a response as well. But that's going to be our priority, and we've got you know we've got our work plan laid out for us. I think the question was also mentioned about is wages and benefits the priority? It, it certainly is, but the history of these bargaining sessions has also been a number of different language items too. And I think both sides have to carefully go through them. We have to look for are there costs involved? Are there ways that we can do this in, in creative ways that don't take away from you know the investment that we have directed to our negotiations? And I think we're in a good place in terms of almost being at that where we can truly focus on wages and benefits. I was at uh, last year, this Alex Ruder, Pioneer Press. Uh, I was at last week's school board meeting, and it sounds like uh, the district has identified areas where it wants to preserve resources. That sounds like you have that $20 million in priorities. But I doubt the union is probably going to walk, want to walk out of this empty handed. So, where are you going to make cuts, and like, what do you see? having to lower funding for in order to get to a point that everybody is fine with? Well, again, you, I shared that our number is about $107 million, but factored into that is the cost to continue our services in St. Paul Public Schools. So we know there's going to be an inflationary adjustment. Um, our Chief of uh, Business and Finance Services has been very open about presenting uh, both our revenue and our expenditures <coughs> and showing where that gap exists. And we'll continue through our, our budget process, through a process we are called, called Stop, Start, Sustain, 
where we've identified investments that we want to sustain. But we've got a long list of things that we're going to be reducing or removing from our budget as well. We don't have them itemized, and certainly the result of this contract settlement uh, could play a factor in that. But I also don't want to put that all on, on this. I mean, it's important that we get a fair contract settled, uh, but it's also important for the community to know that our administration is also committed to ensuring we have a fiscally responsible budget uh, that's presented to the Board of, Board of Education this spring. We have time for one more, Susie. Yeah. Sorry, Dr. Gotham, this is for you again. It's uh, on you are leaving and going to Madison. Um, talk about leaving and your reflections and what you're looking forward to and maybe any kind of disappointments you might have. Or what was it like? What's your experience been? No, oh, zero disappointments. It, today's not the time to talk about reflecting on uh, the time I spent here. I'm focused on supporting uh, my team and making sure and, and representing the board and making sure that we get this contract settled. Thank you.